John chapter 4. And if you look it down at verse 20, and we'll read uh, four verses there. John 4, starting verse 20. Right in the middle of the conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman. She says, verse 20, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. Well, we're gathered here today largely for worship with the uh, band coming and ministering to us, and I thought in the time that we have to listen to what God has to say himself about worship. And this passage points out something very interesting, and that is God seeks people to worship him. God seeks that. It says in verse 23, such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. Now think about that. You're here today, and God is seeking your worship. You. Your worship. God seeks after that this, this morning. That's what this is teaching us. Now, what again is worship? Very simply, worship is a gift that we give to God. Just as you would be invited to someone's birthday party and you would bring a gift to give to that person. So you have come here this morning and able to give a gift to God. The gift of thanks, the gift of praise, the gift of love. To be able to give him that gift. That is why we have worship on Sunday mornings. And God says, I seek that from you. I seek your worship. This morning, God is seeking your worship. But another thing this passage teaches us is that not all worship is acceptable to God. Not all the gifts that he gets are acceptable. Verse 23 says, true worshipers worship the Father in spirit and truth. True worshipers. Now, if there's true worshipers, does that mean there's untrue worshipers? Well, the answer to that is very clearly yes. And we learn that from the very first act of worship recorded in the Bible. Do you remember what the very, very first act of worship, who was involved in the very first recorded act? Cain and Abel. I'm sure Adam and Eve worshipped, but we don't have it recorded. The first recorded act is Cain and Abel, and they're both bringing their sacrifices, right? And what did God think of Abel's sacrifice? He accepted it. What did God think of Cain's sacrifice? He, it was unacceptable to God. So God is telling us here, uh, there are true worshipers like Abel and not untrue worshipers like Cain, which means we need to ask ourselves, which are we today? We've all shown up here. There's some sort of worship that we've already given as we've listened, as we've uh, responded to the music and the prayers and the thing. Did you offer him true worship or untrue worship? Worship that is acceptable to him or that is unacceptable to him? Well, what's the difference? Well, this passage teaches us the difference. God says those who worship him must worship him in two ways. What was it? In spirit and in truth. So what does it mean to worship God in spirit and in truth? That's what we're going to look at this moment. Moment. What does God mean by worshiping him? Number one, let's start with worshiping, worshiping him in spirit. What does that mean? We've got to do it, but what does it mean? Um, what is the opposite? Let's say that. What is the opposite of spirit? The opposite of spirit is the physical, right? There's the spiritual and then the physical. This chapter of Jesus said God is spirit. That, is, that means he doesn't have a physical body. He is an invisible, immaterial being. God is spirit. And we must worship him in spirit. So that gives us the idea that there is the way to worship God spiritually in an invisible inner way and then outwardly in an outwardly physical way. And God says that is what is the difference. Now, Israel, um, in a very large way, in their Old Testament worship, was very, very physical in their 
Old Testament worship. They had, remember, first of all, the, the tent tabernacle, and then they had the uh, physical large golden temple. They had the altars of sacrifices. They had the priests. They had the animals that had to be sacrificed. All that was very, very physical. The Samaritan woman says that the Samaritans worshipped on the nearby mountain and that the Jews worshipped down in Jerusalem. Those are all physical places. Old Testament worship was very, very physical. But Jesus is saying that the physicalness of worship was going to change and said, in fact, it is changing as I am speaking to you because I am the Messiah. I have come to bring the new covenant. The old covenant was very physical. The new covenant is not very physical. The new covenant, Jesus himself is the eternal sacrifice so that all the different sacrifices that went on in the Old Testament don't have to take place anymore. And the temple is no longer located in Jerusalem, but where? In each one of us, inside our hearts, as we worship God in our inner spirits. And that is what it means to worship God in spirit. In your insert, I, I put it this way, worshiping from inside your heart. Very simple. Worshiping in spirit means worshiping from inside your heart. The opposite is worshiping primarily on the outside. And Israel was, uh, unfortunately, very good at this. Uh, it says in Jeremiah 12.2, You are near to their lips, but far from their minds. Lips on the outside, minds on the inside. Matthew 15.8 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And what's the result? And in vain do they worship me. That's untrue worship. Worship was going on, but it was untrue worship because it wasn't spiritual. It wasn't coming from the insides of them. It was coming only on the outside of them. And as a nation, that is what Israel was known for, worshiping them on the outside. And God called that worship in vain, empty worship. And listen, that can happen to us today too, right? That can happen to us today. It's easy to come to church and give God the outward worship when it's not going on in your mind and in your heart, right? You know, you show up here and you're tired. You're just tired from a long week. Or maybe you stayed up late Saturday and you're tired. Or maybe there's a bunch of things you've got to do later on today or next week and they're filling your mind. We've all been there. And so you're standing and you're singing the praises that are going on. And where's your heart and your mind? The outside is singing, I love you, Lord. And the inside is, what am I going to do with that problem at work? We've all been there, right? God understands that. God knows that we are prone to do that. But he says, I want to let you know that's not acceptable worship. That's not worshiping me in your spirit. It's worshiping me on the outside. And that is not acceptable. God seeks true worshipers who worship him inside from their spirits. And so how do we fix that? We'd be really intentional about our worship. As I was sitting there, knowing that I was going to be talking about this, I'm thinking, here's the group singing all these songs. I want to be engaged with that, not just letting my mind wander. I want to be kind of leaning forward in my eagerness and listening to what they're saying and responding to what they're saying so that I'm worshiping on the inside. You know, we go to a, you know, a, just a regular secular concert, and we're not there to... You know, we're just there to respond, and, you know, if our mind wanders, there's no big deal. Here, it, it matters. It matters to God. And so to be careful and make sure this doesn't happen, we need to kill a wandering mind. Don't let your mind wander. Kill uh, thoughts of uh, other things coming along and interruptions that are trying to invade in on, even as I'm speaking right now, and as the music's going on now, and someone's praising God. And, you know, make sure that you are giving it your best. You know, sometimes we are invited to someone's birthday party and we don't put much thought into it. We just say, oh, you know what? I don't really have time. Just throw some money in an envelope and give it to them. We don't want to do that with our worship. We just give God, oh, this quickly. You know, that. Show up here with the intention on really giving God the insides of you and your heart and your mind responding to all the things you're hearing and thanking him, praising him, loving him. It's really, really easy to not do that, to, to lose concentration. But that's what God wants us doing. And we all know that's the right way. This isn't anything we've heard for the first time. But it's easy to not give him our heart and mind. 
So the first thing we learn here is that if we're going to worship him with worship that is true worship, that is acceptable, like Abel's was, number one, it's got to be intentionally from your heart and your mind being involved. That's worship in uh, spirit. What about the other one, worship in truth? What does it mean to worship God in truth? Well, the Samaritans were an interesting people. Jesus is talking to the Samaritan woman. The Samaritans, as you probably know, uh, were half Jew and half Gentile. They had Jewish blood in them, but there was also Gentile, non-Jewish blood. And very interesting, they accepted about half of the Jewish religion as well. They had many books of the Bible by this time, many, Old Testament, you know, but they only accepted about five. The first five books of the Bible is what the Samaritans had as their Bible. The rest, the Psalms and Proverbs and all the history books and prophecies of Isaiah, and they didn't accept any of that, which meant that they had the basics of God down, but not enough to worship him the right way. Some knowledge, but not enough knowledge because they limited it to just the first five books of the Bible. Uh, for instance, God commanded that worship take place in Jerusalem at the temple. That was the only place where the priests were, then the altar was, and the sacrifices could, that could be made to take away your sins. But they said, no, we're going to skip all that, and we're going to have worship on our own local mountain here near Samaria. Well, that's not according to God's truth. God's truth says how to do it the right way. They were dismissing it and doing it the way they felt that they wanted to do it. Uh, they may have sincerely be coming to God to worship on their mountain, but they were coming with hearts full of unforgiven sin, right? Because there was no priest, there was no sacrifice. They were just kind of going on their own. They may have been worshiping in spirit, their heart and their minds involved, but in truth, they were gone. They weren't living according to God's truth. Jesus says it's got to be not just in your spirit, but also according to the truth, and that's the that's what. Worshiping in truth means, in your insert, worshiping, it means worshiping by living by. Worship from living by God's truth. All around the world today, there's people worshiping God. You know, there's Muslims and Buddhists and Hindus and Jews, all worshiping God very sincerely this morning, maybe many of them. But what? They don't accept Jesus as God's son, the king of the world who has come to save our lives. They don't accept that. As a result, their worship is not true. It's unacceptable to God. Worship might be going on really from their heart, but it's not according to truth, and that makes it unacceptable. And just like the spiritual worship, worshiping in truth can be lacking in Christians' lives too. We can come to God this morning ready to worship him, but not living from lives coming and committed to his truth. If we come to a worship service and we're having sex outside of marriage, if we're having hatred in our heart towards someone, if we haven't forgiven someone for a sin that they have done to us, if we're abusing drugs and, or alcohol, these are things that God says, that's not living according to my truth. My truth is to not practice these things. And if you you and I come and we're practicing things that he says, don't do this, then our worship is not acceptable to him. Psalm 24 talks about who may worship the Lord. It says in Psalm 24, 3, who may go up to the Lord's mountain? Who may stand in his holy place? The one who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not long for what is false or a lie. We are not true worshipers when we have unclean hands and impure hearts and long for what is false. God says may we, we may be really sincere, but if we've got these, this impurity going on in our lives and we're not addressing it and not forsaking it, then God says, this is unacceptable worship to me. And we know that in Cain's case, that's what was going on. He, he was offering sacrifices. There, there it is, but on the inside... He had a heart that had sin going on that he wasn't tur turning from. True worshipers worship God from hearts living in his truth. And Jesus tells us what to do. Jesus in Matthew chapter 5, said 25, 23 says this, If you are offering your gift at the altar and remember 
there, remember there that another believer has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First go away and make peace with that person, and then come back and offer your gift. So God is telling us here, look, before we worship, we've got to get our lives in line at living, in living with God's truth. So we have something, maybe you're sitting here, and maybe through this sermon, God has pricked your conscience about something that you are doing right now that he said, don't do that. If you are aware of that, what does God want you to do? Don't continue, just put that on the back shelf and continue worshiping after the sermon. No, he's saying stop right now before you do any more worshiping. Confess that to sin. Forsake it. Turn away. Get your life in harmony with him. Say, God, I'll, I'll start doing the right thing. And then proceed with worshiping for the rest of the service. What is that? That's living by God's truth. And that's what we must do if we want to be able to have acceptable worship from God. God seeks true worshipers. And that only comes from those who are living from God's truth, their lives in harmony with God's truth. And no, we can't do that perfectly, but we can aim at it perfectly, right? We aim at 100% obedience, not 99 or 75. We aim at 100%, and when we fall short, we confess, forsake it, keep aiming high. If you're aiming lower than 100% today, God's saying, that's not what I've called you to do. You seek to be like my son. You'll not be able to practice it perfectly, but you can aim at it. Just like a hunter aims at the center of the target, not the edge, not the side, not the tree. Aims at the bullseye. So we are to aim at the bullseye every time. So in a moment we're going to return to worship. And remember, God seeks that from you. You. You're very important to God. If you were the only one here sitting in these pews, God would say, I want you. I seek your worship from me. But also remember, not all worship is acceptable to him. It's got to be coming from two places. It's got to be coming from inside, not just outside, inside, and and from a life living by God's truth. So, how is your worship that you've offered already? Was that something that God was pleased with? Acceptable in his sight? If not, number one, if you find, you know what, I really let my mind wander, and it really was kind of just on my lips, but not going on my heart, change that. Say, okay, please forgive me, Lord. I forsake that. And for the rest of this service, I'm going to be actively involved in all that's going on. And then number two, make sure your heart is pure and clean before him, that you don't have unconfessed sin going on in your life. You may not be able to resolve the problem right now, but confess the problem to God and make that right between you and him before we go any further so that you can have, for the rest of the service, worship that is pleasing and acceptable to him like Cain's was. God seeks true worshipers today. He is worthy of that worship. So let's give him, the rest of the service, true worship that will really please him and be acceptable to him.